right, guys, we've reached the magic number, so we have enough of us, so we'll get started so we can all go home. <laughs> Call to order at 6 o'clock. Any adjustments to the agenda? Kathy, if you wouldn't mind passing around a sign-up sheet for those in the conference room, so I can add them to the minutes. Oh, good. Jamie's on it. I'll actually just take notes. All right. Um, Jamie, approve, approve the minutes of Monday, October 25th. Do no. a motion? And a second. 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 Any discussion on the minutes? All right. Hearing none, so move. Approve the minutes of Monday, November 8th. So move. Second. Second. Any discussion? All right. Hearing none, minutes are approved. Board correspondence communications. Anybody have anything they need to share? Um, I would like to bring something up. I think um, at this point in time, Bill and I are the sole survivors showing up to meetings for schools that we're rotating to go to. So I would suggest to make it easier on everybody for setting up meetings that we hold them at the central office until we're actually out meeting in public again and people are coming to meetings. Mm -hmm. We were in Royalton and we've been here and it's been Bill and I. Mm -hmm. and it's a little bit complicated to get everything set up at the different schools if nobody's attending there. So how do people feel about that? I, it sounds reasonable. I think it's reasonable. Okay. I, I had meant to be there and just got delayed and couldn't couldn't get there. So because I do believe we I personally feel with a mask, I can be there. Um, right. And we can go to the central office. So it's not yeah. saying we're doing all virtual meetings, but instead of setting up for two people to show up, it makes sense for them to be able to do the meetings where we're already set up. <laughs> if it's easier on Ray, that's the key. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. All right. So next month we will be at the SU office, guys. All right. Good idea. Anything else anybody has for correspondence or they want to? Uh, yeah, just, uh, just an enormous appreciation again. For all our teachers and all the contact tracing that's happening with the cases, um, it's really an enormous amount of work, and it takes up you know the, the weekend goes usually. Um, so I just appreciation for all the work that's going into that and the care. I would totally second that one hundred percent. It would be really nice, Jamie, if you could share that out for us for the teachers that are listening. To that. Absolutely. Um, we really appreciate. It. I. I not a job I would want right now. <laughs> All right. Um, board development series, maybe? That's just a standing thing, but I have an update. Okay. Um, so Susan, as she had indicated at our last meeting, is retiring from the VSBA. I received an email from her today saying that they she believes there'll be a replacement, but they won't be onboarding until sometime in January and that they won't be prepared to continue with our board development series in February when we're supposed to pick back up with it. So I emailed her and said, should I be expecting Sue, um, the executive director and or this replacement to reach out to me soon to let me know what that um, revised schedule may look like. And she said that she was gonna pass that information on to Sue and that we were a top priority. So I would say it doesn't look promising for February. I'm hoping that we can pick back up with it in March. But I just want to give you that update on that. And right now, they don't have anyone to do board development in general. And I know some other boards have talked about that work. And uh, right now, they don't have anyone to support us in that work at the moment. Jamie, I thought Susan said that she would be available to do some of that, even if she retired. That is not what I gathered from her email today, but I'm happy to follow up if the board would like. I mean, that's what she said. Um, you know, it might have changed, but that's at least what I heard. Um, email today 
essentially said, we don't think we have anyone for you, but we'll be in touch with you when we might. So we'd be meeting, we'd be missing two development board development. We weren't planning to go start, February? no, we weren't ready. To, we were not planning to start back up with them, I believe. I'd have to look at the calendar. I think it was February. And so, or January, that's what it says, Bill. So they don't even have anyone hired to start. Sue did not offer her services. Maybe Sarah, she talked to the VSBA and it was decided that that would be in conflict. I don't know, but I can ask her and in, inquire more. I just was giving you the update that the VSBA, who we had talked to to do it, which is part of a service that you already pay for, we don't have to pay for that, right? She just comes as part of your guys' membership. She said they would not have anyone hired until January and that she was not confident they could service us in February either. I say it's, go ahead. What was, what was on tap next for us to do? Was it two more sessions or did we just have one left? And was there a topic? I think it was four. Oh, four. Oh my. Well, just for what it's worth, I have found them really helpful. So thank you for doing that. Great. So we had board meeting protocols scheduled for January 24th and establishing a vision and engage the community for February 28th and uh, policy and monitoring for March 28th. Yeah, all those sound great. And the format, I, I like the way that you were doing it, where it was that first 45 minutes of these meetings. So. And I have tried to push those out after two for folks who can't be in attendance and have tried to encourage our board members to watch them. It, is it worth spending the money to see if we could find somebody, I don't know, Boston, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, to come and do these, to keep it going? Or we think we could just wait? Well, I say we wait until next month and see if they have any updates, Jamie. Yeah, no, like I said, um, I haven't heard from Sue directly, right? I just heard from Susan. Okay. Um, and so I did follow up with an email, and we'll see what that re reply is. I just got this email this morning, so. I would suggest that if Susan is, is retiring and, and we want to, if we get to the place where we want to pay, my guess is she'd do it for a fee. Go ahead, Bill. I was going to say that um, uh, the Vermont School Board Association is very important for us. And, but, and I think their number one priority and a very important priority for us is to make sure and to strengthen the effectiveness um, of the boards and the SU board on how we operate and how we work with our superintendent and, and his team. Um, so this is, these development sessions are great. I think our key priority is not only for us to do our jobs as well and as best as we can, uh, but the Vermont School Board Association. And I, my recommendation is that uh, Jamie um, or Kathy communicate um, our strong interest in that we get that level of service continued as soon as possible. And um, uh, th these sessions are very important. I like the framework that Jamie worked out. We're not using the whole session, but uh, we all can learn th from them. And uh, the, the quicker we learn, uh, the better we'll, we'll be as effective board members and effective leaders, educational leaders. So I'd, I'd like to let, I think we should let Sue know directly that um, they need to make this a priority. I don't mind sending off an email to Jamie. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jamie will follow up and I'll also send off an email. But I, I agree with Bill, they're important and we're, we're paying for the, the SBA service in general, so I think they should be providing the service that they commit to for us. Okay, and then we'll we'll talk about it again, and we'll put it on here. Talk about it again in December and see if we've got sure. any updates. I'll have an update weekend okay. together. Is there any public comment tonight? Okay, hearing none. Um, reports to the board. Jamie. Uh, good evening. You have my report in hand. 
I'm not very articulate tonight, so I apologize. <laughs> I think I have COVID uh, on the mind, but uh, I, uh, not COVID brain, COVID on the mind. Um, and so I, I got to say, I'm really excited that our vaccination clinics are happening. I'm excited that uh, we're starting to PCR test. We should be ready to antigen test soon. Um, just to give uh, the board uh, an approximate number of um, students we have currently right now quarantined across the SU, I expect it to be around 100, cool. if not a little more. So that's the level of antigen testing we would be doing. Um, the rate of positivity in the SU over the last two weeks has been significantly higher than it's been at any other time. Uh, our contact tracing efforts are happening almost daily. And um, Ethan, you're absolutely right. It is certainly uh, taxing, but I would say that it is incredible um, just how many folks have stepped up. And uh, we've had some community members step up who are supporting efforts to do antigen testing in the mornings who are retired nurses. Um, we've had three different medical professionals who are retired, who are gonna step back into the workforce and support these efforts. Uh, we're leveraging FEMA money to pay for this, and then what FEMA money cannot cover, we're then, we'll then leverage ESSER money, just so folks know. Um, we do have students getting vaccinated. That will assist greatly with the contact tracing efforts, because a reminder, those who are vaccinated, if, they have, if they're asymptomatic, they remain in school. Um, and so that's exciting news. Those that are unvaccinated, as soon as we are ready to roll with the antigen testing, uh, which will be within the next two weeks, they'll be able to be tested first thing in the morning and then remain as long as they're negative. We are not seeing significant spread in the building, just so you know. But when you look at our data in general in the state, it just means there's going to be more positivity coming in. Right. And so that's what's occurring. And so when we do have positivity, the Department of Health then does require us to contact trace. Um, I will say the Department of Health has been more responsive recently. I think that they've been able to increase their workforce. We're getting uh, more timely data from them. I will say one of the most frustrating cases that we've had was that there was a lapse of seven days at one point between a positive, a positive result and them notifying us. Um, that was very uh, frustrating and certainly frustrating for our families to let them know that their children had been identified as a close contact and that contact had happened over a, a week prior. Um, and so what I would say is, is that all of our efforts are to keep our students in person, learning and having less disruption on the educational operations, meaning having to go consistently back to remote, back to in-person, back to remote, is not conducive for best learning. And it's certainly not conducive. Uh, it's not, I actually would say it's just not sustainable. That it's pretty taxing right now, and it's not a sustainable way for it. So certainly us getting our everything in place to try to keep our students here and to not have to quarantine significant amounts of students is the better. Had his hand up. Don, you had a question? I did. Jamie, what's the method that the antibody testing is done with? Is it a nasal swab or how's what's the, what's the process? Yeah, it's a nasal swab. Um, and they're all front swabbing is what I guess the technical term is. At least that's what my contact tracer, I mean, my, my uh, COVID um, coordinator called it earlier today. And uh, so we'll be able to swab right at the school. We'll have a different entrance for those students who have been identified as close contacts. We will swab. We have the results within 15 minutes, Don. And if they're yep. negative, then they stay. And, you know, in general, like I said, we would expect them to be negative based on the data we've been collecting. It's not like we've had positivity come in and then seen, you know, significant spread. Um, and so if a student is then identified to be positive, we would PCR test them and they would go home just to confirm the positivity. Um, and we would await the PCR test. Okay. If they test negative, then they stay. 
And the data that has supported this effort um, has mostly been out of Massachusetts. Um, they've had really, really good indications that this antigen testing has worked successfully um, in predicting uh, positivity. Thank you. Stacy. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for the update. I was curious if the case involving seven day delay between identifying the positivity and contact tracing resulted in any additional spread? You know, that case did not, that I am aware of. Good. Um, I'm aware of some situations where there was what appeared to be in school transmission. We don't determine that though, the Department of Health does. And I will say another frustration I think for us has been that we try to report that data off of their dashboard and that dashboard seems to be delayed and so I think that that has been frustrating for some of our families because we want to give them accurate and reliable data and the data we report from is their dashboard. But I would say that that does not, it's updated weekly, although I don't feel like it's necessarily always accurate. Thanks, Jamie. I agree with you. That dashboard is not always accurate by my mind. Sarah? How many of our schools have um, positivity? Well, over the last two weeks, all of our schools have had positivity, <laughs> but one. It was two until today, but there was positivity at Stratford today. I must say, I think, I, I don't know if people are as sick of hearing my voice as I am uh, doing the alert now, just because every time my heart drops, and I gotta say, I just, if families are hearing, and, I, and, it, and just for the board members, it has, I have been, I actually, I did well up with tears today doing it because I know this is gonna really impact Thanksgiving plans for some of our families. And this impacted Thanksgiving last year, and it, it just, I feel really badly that that could be the case again um, when folks are being identified as close contacts. So I just know that that's certainly, I guess it's weighing on your superintendent. I, I'll just say, I totally support what you're doing. And this is what, this is how we're doing it. And there, you know, everyone's got to be ready for this. And if they're not, that's their problem, not ours. Ours are, to keep, ours are to keep the schools open and healthy and educating, and you're doing a great job. All right, guys, anything else, Jamie? Nope. There's a lot of good instructional stuff happening too, and that's why we brought Onda on board, so that when these things hit the fan, that we could still continue to focus on instruction. So I get excited when her, you have her report. <laughs> Thank you. And I think that's even a true where I'm hearing from families whose kids are home remote learning, which is fine, but not our preferred method, how fresh, how upset the kids are and how eager they are to get back to school, which is like the best thing that you can hear when you're in our roles that like kids want to be back in the classroom mm -hmm. with their teacher and with their friends. And this isn't just sort of a way to, you know, stay home and, and, and skip out on school. So I think that's from the the family conferences I've been in recently, that's what I'm hearing the most. So that's, that's I think, a good, a good sign, too. Um, you also have my report. Uh, the first part there, we've really um, been focusing um, with our uh, school leaders and, um, and school-based leadership and, uh, and teachers on having these MTSS leadership teams. This is something that really um, got launched this year, though there are kind of pieces in place in previous years. Um, and it's been a really good way to, um, to have really con regular conversations that connect all the dots. So how, do our, how does our continuous improvement plan at the school level connect to the ongoing professional development plan? What are we learning from the assessment data? How does that, and so it just, it has um, the kind of the regular conversations with a good diversity of people at, at each school or district um, is helping to really connect the dots and also 
across the across the schools, knowing what um, with me participating in all the meetings, I can sort of share practices that are happening across the schools. That's not as easy for people to do who are you know in school specific locations. So um, we've had just a lot of success with uh, those meetings um, getting going and really informing practices at the schools. Uh, I've talked a lot about math because it is really a, an area of, um, of focus to try to bring it up to the level of the literacy focus that we've had for the last couple of years. So one place where we are focusing right now, particularly in um, conversations with teachers, is just how to how to address the differing needs in their classrooms. And I think they may be wider than they sometimes have been before because of the disruption in learning over the last couple of years and just um, a lot of, you know, a lot of different factors. And, uh, you know, one interventionist in a school or in a district is not someone that's going to solve sort of that level of um, of different um, background knowledge and skills. And so really working with our teachers around how do you differentiate in that universal instruction block. So that's that's got a lot of our focus. And we have a lot of good practices that happen in literacy and, and translating some of those, more of those over into the math context, I think will be helpful because it's a familiar practice, but just putting a new, a new content in it. So that's what's happening on um, sort of the per personalization side of things. Um, and then as I started, we've had, you know, we've just come through sort of the month of, um, of uh, conferences, parent, guardian, teacher conferences, um, and generally have heard really good reports back on that. Um, they were offered in person and virtual, depending on sort of where, what families were interested in, where school, individual schools were in terms of, um, you know, number of cases they had with COVID, and I think have generally worked really well. Um, and we've talked a lot about student voice, and I just had this great hearing about this, these kindergarten-led student conferences at a school where the, you know, we, I think we often think about student-led conferences at the middle school and the high school level, and to hear these kindergartners um, share sort of what they've been working on and what they were excited about, and really give it, I think it's important for our youngest learners to be, um, you know, leaders of their own learning, um, and it's a great practice that we will look to be expanding uh, across all of our schools and grade levels. And it was really fun to hear it's already in kindergarten in, in some of our schools. So I am happy, I, you'll hear more from me later on the um, on the achievement goals, but happy to take any questions on uh, on any of this. Yeah, um, Ethan. Um, uh, I guess what we're three months in now to sort of the updated math curriculum is, um, or, you know, really focusing on it? Is there any signs of a change? Is there any sign of rethinking in the teachers? What's what's sort of what what's going on with that? Or what's your feel? With yeah. what's going on? That, I mean, that's a great question. I will um, I will say that when I think about adopting new instructional resources, I, I often think of it over a three year span of just like the first year, year is really trying to get familiar with it. Um, in some cases, people had some familiarity with the, the resources. In some places, it's totally new to them. So that part looks a little bit different in different schools. Um, one of the biggest changes is that it, with the bridges and math, which is in our elementary school, is the number corner, which is just a way to sort of um, both sometimes introduce new skills, but really review skills and put it sort of in a calendar format like you might see in a morning meeting. Um, and I think for some teachers, that's a that's a that's a that feels brand new and trying to figure out how does it fit into my day and how do I get through this and how do I lead good number discussions around the patterns that are being built. And that's where we've seen a lot of growth over the last two months of people, teachers feeling a lot more comfortable with it. Um, and I mean, I, every time I go into a classroom, the number corner, which is this calendar is totally up to date. It's like right on that day. So, you know, folks are doing it and they're having these good discussions and it really builds sort of that, that skill base. So I think that's one really good place one place I think where we're going to continue to work is on the hands-on part of it. For some folks, like are just they're just making all of the manipulatives and the models that are available available to kids so they can really like dig into them um, and have the space in your classroom where kids can access those tools. And I think those are places where we're still working on figuring out how to how to shift sort of our mindset around math is really getting your hands into it. It's not all stuff you just do in your head. Um, and memorization. And so I think that's kind of one of the next steps for um, people's familiarity with the program is to really see those manipulatives as like just the same as a pencil and all the other tools. So that's, I think that's where we are. But um, I think people are feeling more comfortable certainly with it. Great. No, thank you. Thank you. That's just what Thanks. I want. Anyone else? 
I'll just add uh, to just piggyback on Honda a little bit. Teachers, you know, I think organizations have to have stress. And what I mean by that, I think there's an optimum stress around change. And so part of what we're trying to do is change the teaching practice in math. And I hear from our teachers, they're a little stressed in their math practice right now. So what I would say, Ethan, that means that we are creating some change. Now it's our job to try to decrease stress so it doesn't become a barrier, right? But the fact that there's this talk around some stress in math says to me, all right, that means we are creating some instructional change. And so I would say that that's another indicator that um, I'm happy about because that means folks are really trying to implement. And so kudos to them. And it's our job to help support them with those efforts. Nice. All right. Thank you, Anda. Thank you, Beth. You're up. All right. Good evening. Um, I also have you also on my uh, reports. Uh, I included the child count number from December of 2020. Our child count for December 2021 isn't due till December 15th, so I'll include that um, in my report for next month. Um, so you'll have an updated number. But I did include um, a chart of our initial special education evaluations. So those are students that have been referred in and then gone through the evaluation process. Um, to be eligible or not eligible for special education within um, our SU. Um, and as you can see, I, I included the 19-20 the, uh, school year, which was cut short um, because of the COVID closure. Um, so that means all evaluations kind of halted and were paused um, during that March to the end of the school year, year date. So what my prediction is, is when you're looking at the 2021 school year, a lot of those numbers are higher because that's the carryover from the year before. Um, and I can tell you um, from the numbers for this school year so far, um, those most of those are also a carryover from last spring that were approved by the previous director of special services. But also, um, we have had quite a few students um, move in from out of state. Um, and when a student moves in from out of state who um, is in special education in the state they're coming from, we need to do an initial evaluation to find them eligible here in our state. Um, so that number is also included. Um, and we've had quite a few um, move in um, from September till now. Um, out of the 12 um, initial evaluations uh, that have been started, two have been completely uh, finished. Um, it can take about two to three months to do a, a complete evaluation. It's a long process. I've included the process um, in my report so you can have an idea of what's, of what's kind of done and looked at in the process. It's very thorough. Um, it includes you know, a couple of meetings and a lot of data collection um, and assessments and uh, observations and conversations um, with parents and teachers um, and even the students. Um, so it can be a long process. Um, but two have been fully completed and both of those um, students um, have been found eligible using the current uh, Vermont regulations. Um, those regulations, uh, just so everyone knows, I've also included it in my report, um, are going to be changing slightly um, due to you know, Act 173. Uh, it's caused Vermont to look at and reevaluate uh, special education regulations and law here in Vermont. Um, so starting July 1, um, there will be some changes um, in the definition of special education, which we learned more about today um, in an office hours. Um, there's uh, going to be new sections added to the IEP uh, for parental input. Um, there's also going to be a change um, in the way adverse effect is used in the special education process. Uh, so there's a lot of changes uh, coming in the way 
um, for special education, which I'll be rolling out to special education, special educators um, towards the end of the school year. I've kind of already given them a heads up so they are aware. Um, and so we're going to be working through that process together. Um, the next section just talks about we're still um, going over flexible pathways and the importance of flexible pathways and personalized learning plans. Um, especially, uh, we're finding more students are having some difficulties right now with mental health and social emotional concerns. And I think some of it is, is brewing more because we're still in a pandemic, you know, kind of atmosphere and students are, are really still feeling their, those effects. So um, we're definitely having more conversations about flexible pathways. And then lastly, um, talking about uh, interventions, we are gonna be offering uh, in early December, um, math intervention from the bridges, uh, math bridges intervention, so to align with um, the Bridges uh, curriculum that we're using in some of our schools. It's a standalone program, um, but it is from the same, same company and has similar philosophy. Um, so that'll be really great because a lot of our special educators were kind of coming up with their own activities and nothing really, you know, standardized and tested and proven. Um, so now they'll have a natural intervention program um, so we'll be going through that process starting in early December, um, and there'll be some coaching and everything afterwards throughout the year. Um, and then Jamie uh, Feinberg is also coming back uh, to do more direct instruction reading, um, uh, coaching, and instruction. So we're really um, we're really getting deep in our intervention process um, with our special educators and even some of our para educators. Okay, oh, then. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, uh, wasn't there talk that this was all going to become block grants? And that was going to yes. change everything. Am I remembering correctly? Has that been instituted? And are we dealing with that now, or is that still to come? It starts July 1. That's Act 173. Yeah. Yep, that's a good question. That's the connection. And is that. So how is how I mean are are we preparing for the changes? What is that? How is that going to affect budgeting and and things like that? Yeah, good question. They just started rolling out some. The AOE just started rolling out some guidance about it today. Um, so far, what it looks like is um, the service plan that I needed to put together uh, back in October was abbreviated. Um, and it looks like the SEER grant we found out today is also going to be abbreviated. Um, and what it means is Sorry, that what, do you, what do you mean by sorry? Uh, what do you mean by abbreviated? What does that mean? Um, short, shortened. They're asking for less information. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, Ethan, financially, the budget you're seeing it, yeah. it tonight is going to be the expenditure side. Yeah. We are budgeting for the revenues that we expect to receive based on the block grant the new funding formula. So we don't expect it actually to impact us all that much. Okay. Um, and so like less than one FTE, we do expect that there may be a little less revenue yep. that comes in, but you'll see we we're proposing that we keep special education expenditures down again this year. And so mm -hmm. that speaks to that our system of supports is working. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I think that we're primed to implement this. The other big piece to this though, is it does make funding more flexible. So the money that comes into us for interventions and supports is not tied directly to those services in an IEP. And so it allows us to provide interventions and supports as the teams of teachers feel fit and see gotcha. fit. And it, it, it also gives us more flexibility to say, if you're a special educator and you can best provide the intervention to this student, then go ahead and do so, even if they're not in on the IEP. Also, the same holds true. Oh, we have a reading interventionist who is the most skilled person to provide the reading intervention to a student who served the IEP. You go ahead and provide that intervention. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. not that you know the intervention is tied to this IEP. 
and that the funding formula just supports that method. Okay. So it gives us more flexibility, which is what that whole study was about and what the act was built on. So I'm actually really excited and I'm excited and certain supervisory unions are seeing more significant financial hit. We, we are coming out in a pretty good place with this. Good. Thank you. We will not hit as hard as, as other SUs are. So we, we should be okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, could you? Yeah. I'm not sure I understand what these graphs mean. Sure. And I. Are they telling us that this is good news? Are these people that, that we have fewer to evaluate? That means we have fewer in special ed and we're trying to move our school population so that they don't need special ed? Um, or is this so is our, just the evaluation yeah. headcount right now? What? How do, how do I interpret this? Is this good news or not? Well, I don't think we know yet. Okay. <laughs> um, the hope is that the amount of initial evaluations will go down per year, right. because if that's the case, then that means we are we are collecting students quicker um, to give them the interventions um, and strategies that they need earlier, um, and that those strategies are working. So the hope is that we will catch them earlier so they will not need to go to the level of an initial evaluation. So is this the 43 to 12, and should we celebrate? Um, well, 12 is only till November, right. and the rest are, are August to June. Okay. So maybe we can celebrate in June is the hope that the number will be less. And you mentioned 220, 240 students or 19%. That was from last last year's tab. Are those the ones that were evaluated or those that were evaluated and declared need to meet the state standard for special needs? Those are all of the students in our SU that qualify for special education. So our goal would be if you remember, we've talked about this in the past. Research really speaks to students with specific learning disabilities is about 5%, right? So, I mean, really a goal for us as an SU, as we continue to make indicator goals on our overarching, right, like these data goals, would be that a good indicator for MTSS would be if we could get that under 10%. Yes, yeah, so that's We're not going to do her that overnight, yeah. but that would speak to the fact that we have early intervention happening. Mm -hmm. And folks may say, well, Jamie, why is 10 percent like, why is that? Well, we should be able to meet students' needs without them demonstrating a specific learning disability through high quality universal instruction and intervention, right? And so I will say 19% though is when you, and we can find this data and start to report this out to you next month when we do the child find numbers again, you're gonna get this year's data. The state average, we're right there if not better. Um, and so that's, that's not, we're not in a, like a bad place, but I, there's room to grow. Thank you, I, that's very helpful. Anyone else? Thank you. Sure. Tara. I didn't say. Oh, sorry, Greg. <laughs> sorry, Ray. You're up, right? Yeah, hey, thank you. Board Chair. Uh, you have my report, and I would entertain any questions from board members at this time. As I try to scroll through my own report here. <laughs> uh, key parts about uh, the increased amount of communication coming out of the superintendent's office. And then uh, average daily membership. And the update for today is we're at 1645 and still awaiting some from one wow. specific school. So, That's huge. Yeah, so we're probably going to come in pretty close to our high water number there in 1920 at 1653. We might get to 1665, give or take. That's awesome. Now, uh, ADM average daily membership is the feedstock for equalized pupils, which Tara will be talking to you more about in the future. I would entertain any questions. Thank you. That's right. Anybody got questions for Ray? Can I just say something? Sure. Sorry. I, 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 
I got to tell you, the work that's being done on ADM, I will put the team effort around Ray's work with our registrars and connecting with Tara's office around paying tuition. I'll put this process that's been developed up against anyone's. I believe we are counting every kid that is our kid. And that's important. And I think that's part of why you're going to see this number possibly at the highest it's been is that we're, we're making certain we get every student. And so huge thank you, Ray. It, it, it takes a village, thanks, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of effort by a lot of people. Absolutely, and I gotta say, that has been a huge learning curve for me because I always have my kids in my building. And so this idea that we've got students who we haven't seen for multiple years who maybe left one high school to go to another high school, I mean, it is pretty incredible as we sit down with principals and registrars and look through the list. It's, yeah, it is massive, uh, Stacy. So, yeah, it's that part is, uh, it's, it's labor intensive. But it needs some money. It does. Well, well, it's a, I'll just, oh, go ahead, Megan. Yeah, just a quick question. I think I, I usually think of ADM as really relevant. Um, for building level, like when we, or for um, specific districts as we pass those budgets, because that's how we're calculating the per pupil. So I'm just kind of surprised to see it on that uh, grand scale. And I'm wondering if you could help me understand a little bit, like how, what's the difference of, is that just, I mean, it's awesome. To, and I agree that that's a very crazy number to gather, but then does that just translate out to useful as you then like deal it out to each of our individual schools or is that useful to you at the SU level as well? Well, so this is an SU meeting. That's why you're seeing SU numbers. But yeah, the, this process, the review process starts early October. So I would have met with your principal multiple times talking about what students are in the building and what students are being tuitioned out either to public schools or to independent schools. I think what Megan's asking is, uh, you know, usually the ADM is about an individual school. How is this useful to the SU having this overall number of the SU? Does that affect budgeting? Does it affect, how does it, what does it affect? Well, the, the budgeting is at the, at the district level. So no, the, the, the number itself doesn't really mean anything in the abstract to the SU, right? It will it will become important at the district level once it be once they once the ADM becomes equalized pupils. Got because it. That makes sense. That's complication awesome. is that your ADM could actually go up while your equalized pupils go down, depending on the weighting factor applied to those. So if you if you've got a lot more pre-Ks but graduated some out some high schoolers, mm -hmm. your ADM could go up, but your equalized pupil numbers go down. Okay. So, we do look at the number as an SU wide. We have certain reports that we have to file with the state as a supervisory union, how many ADMs we have. So we do also look at it as an SU level in our entire supervisory union. Like certainly that number does impact at times what we get for federal funds, like ESSER funds, for example, that come into the SU. And, and are that, not don't come in directly to the districts and that number will also affect um our block census grant which is the new funding for special education that's the number that they'll use um for for the amount of money that we will receive so it's great yes. <laughs> to have a large and accurate yes um, can i give it a um uh, you know i'm positive thinking guy but doesn't the aid the um as it goes up mean that we're attracting more kids and families to the supervisor you to get too. the best education we're competing in my mind at every su in the state of vermont i don't even want to talk about new hampshire Massachusetts. this is vermont and so to me i look at this as a key indicator one of the key indicators that we're we're attracting families, and that's exactly what we need to do. We need to grow um, so that we can have more resources and more teachers and more opportunities. And so I like this as 
I don't know, but to me, it's an indicator. Think of it as if we're shrinking. Um, wow. So, and um, so I don't know. I, this is the number I like to see with the arrow going up. And, yeah. and thanks to Ray's efforts and the efforts of all the schools uh, attracting a new students and families coming back from homeschooling or whatever they're doing or moving in. Uh, yeah. Come to us. <laughs> All right, guys, any more questions for Ray? Thank you, Ray. Sure. Not me, sir. All right, that was my turn <laughs> You have my report, which outlines due dates coming up. So if there's any questions on that, I will happily answer them. Otherwise, we'll switch right over to the first quarter FY22 projections. So again, this year we're doing this on a quarterly basis. So for first quarter, we focused primarily on salaries. Once we were able to complete negotiations for support staff and we could get contracts out, I was able to calculate salaries that were budgeted versus contracts. And we have a projected savings there of $91,164. And then health insurance is budgeted versus enrollment, but we are in open enrollment right now, so this number can change once we have final enrollment done for January 1. But right now we're projecting a savings of $131,623 for an overall projected savings of $222,787. I feel like I'm screaming at you all, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you're talking about projected savings, you can be loud with that. So the second page is on the revenue side. So obviously, um, revenue through September, we don't have a lot coming in at this point. We don't do many grant submissions until we get past first quarter. But overall, um, I do anticipate we'll still get our $24,000 in the indirect rate. We've received so far to date $1,560 in interest income. I anticipate getting our full Medicaid funding. I anticipate getting our full EPSDT MAP funds. And I anticipate getting our full title funds. So I don't see any revenue shortfall there. And same thing with special ed at this point in time based on the expenses that we're seeing, projections that I've had in conversations with Annette and Tracy. I think we're on target so far, so I'm not anticipating any substantial revenue shortfalls at this point in time. So down below, I have updated based on general fund balance at the end of 19 audited, the end of 20 audited, and then the 21 non-audited. And to give you an update on the audit, I received first draft of the SU audit on Friday. Nice. So we are going through it, adding and updating any documents that we need to update. So we are on timeline with audits. Fantastic. Very good news. So any questions on the projection or anything else at this point? I like that we have a surplus. Very <laughs> exciting. <laughs> Yes. Good news, things are going in the right direction. A lot of hard work by our faculty and staff. I also I also like that the audit, who knows, maybe the audit will be a nice quiet thing with no, you know, it'll just happen. And then suddenly we'll have the results and that would be just wonderful for everybody. Well, that sounds like a Christmas wish, Ethan. Well, there you go. It's my Christmas wish. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I can fulfill that Christmas wish. At this point, I'm pretty positive I can. <laughs> we have faith in you. Thank you. All right. Well, that's it for now. I come back on when we talk about the budget. Okay. Um, policy committee. We got to get back to meeting. <laughs> Um, we passed our last couple of policies. Yeah, the last couple of policies, we, we did create um, priorities coming forward. So we'll get back to an agenda and get that up and rolling again. I think I'm looking at Kathy because the calendar is pretty full with budget right now. 
and negotiations. And so trying to figure out when that group meets again, we were doing it prior to these meetings, but we've got task force going on in places. So uh, Kathy and I will put our heads together and email the policy committee about some potential dates. Does that sound all right? And it may not be until January, just so folks know, just because we've got some standing weekly meetings right now. Um, but. Okay, so we're fine. We're fine. Um, Superintendent Evaluation Committee, I did get an email back um, and they're gonna send me a contract, the VSBA is. Um, so when I get that, I will schedule another meeting for that group um, so we can continue on our journey. Uh, negotiations council uh, I we are working now on setting up a meeting with um, the teachers I've sent out an email um, and I'm waiting for a response back to get that initial meeting meeting set we're hopeful it may be next week just so folks know yeah we, just, no. we haven't heard back yet um, okay we're on to discussion items one. Um, we will continue the discussion of the academic achievement goals. Okay, I um, included the the presentation in the board packet too, just so you'd have it ahead of time. Not try to see all of the little numbers on the on the screen. So uh, there's two parts to this. The first one should be quick, but I um, I think I, there was a request when I presented in October, just to see a little bit more of where we're trying to head. So. There's an additional line and set of points added to these first two graphs, which is where the, um, the, the benchmark is for the end of the year for each grade level. So the three sets of lines um, are sort of where our students were in the fall assessment window, which is the only one we've done, which is like was September sort of pre-instruction. Uh, the benchmark for the fall as set by the, the assessment platform and then the benchmark for the end of the year or the spring, we'll do those assessments in, in May. Um, but just to see a little bit more of where, you know, what the kind of what the goal line is for, for the, each grade level. Um, so that's, you, know, you can look at that more, but I think that was just people wanting to see a little bit more beyond just the fall goals. So that the first one here is reading, again, just to remind folks, there's two different sets of lines because we have two different um, assessment platforms that we're using across our, our, uh, our district. So that's, they're not comparable to each other in terms of the numbers, but we just have laid them because it's the you know, same grade level. So the first one is reading and then you can scroll down to math. Um, and it's the same, the same setup in terms of fall performance, fall you know, kind of goal performance and then end of year. Any questions just on the, that updated, those updated graphs? Okay, so then the second part of this is, um, is just um, more detailed. We, I know, um, we got, I think, uh, from the conversation we had in October to continue along the same path in terms of where we were setting our, uh, potentially setting achievement goals for um, the SU. Um, and I just wanted to, so this wasn't sort of operating outside of our, you know, our overall work, just make sure um, that we are actually thinking about the three goals that we already have as an SU around sort of a comprehensive MTSS system, our proficiency based learning system, and then looking at equitable educational opportunities and student voice. And so those are sort of the three SUI goals. Um, and we think about these as being kind of some of the, the academic indicators. So I sort of swapped out the word goal because I think we've got our goal set, but these are some of the indicators we'll use to measure progress on those goals. Um, so the next slide is um, thinking, uh, it shares those, those indicators. The update here um, was, uh, I think they're, they're generally uh, the same. Um, you'll see when we, we pull out indicator two that we've figured out what the actual um, reducing in half would look like at each grade level rather than across the SU because I think it will make it a little bit more tangible to, to figure out um, where, we're, where we're making progress and where we've still got more work to do. So on the next slide, you've got the, I think this is also a, a new graph for folks because we've got um, the recent results 
from at the state level of the summit of um, the summit of assessment in the spring, the SBAC. We just received the state level results. We had shared sort of the uh, the SU and the district and school level results earlier in the fall. Um, but this uh, this graph shows it's a little it's it's all kind of combined together because there's just not that much of a gap between. Uh, particularly in reading about where we are, where the average of the whole state is, and where the sort of the goal is for proficiency, they're all they're fairly tight in there. But you so you can see, and they're kind of tracking along. Um, and you do see, as we've talked about before, a, a little bit of a fall off in our performance um, in sort of the upper upper middle school grades. And so that's certainly an area that we're we're talking about and thinking about more. There's a bigger gap between us and the and the state and the. Um, like the marks for proficiency. So to kind of taking that in, that information then sort of informed how we set up the indicator for the for for the first um, the first indicator, which again was taking our current performance, looking at trying to exceed the proficiency benchmark by the year 2025, which aligns to what the the goals that the the whole state has set. Um, and then taking that the difference between those two and setting interim targets so that this just this just confirms where those targets are um, and the proficiency benchmark has stayed the same there is a, a mark down at the bottom that it could update what the most recent information I have from the state is that that benchmark is is staying the same so I think we only anticipate that it would change if the the whole assessment system changed um, but those so those will be our goals and um, we'll look at those targets each year and see how we're doing for English language arts from the tested grades, which are grades three through nine. Just stop me if there's anything that needs a little bit more explanation. Um, the, the last graph for this indicator just takes that, ta that, that table and puts it in graphic form for so if that's an easier way to see um, where you are. So the red dots are where we are right now or at the, the, end, of, of the end of last school year. Um, and just uh, heading towards the, our 2025 target uh, is in blue. And you can sort of see that some of the grade levels have a little bit more room to grow. Um, and then some of them are a little, are a little tighter into the, the mark. Um, the other thing just to know as obviously every year a cohort moves up a grade level. So there's both, right? Like there's both work to do with in, the, in a, a current um, grade level around if we've got any gaps in our curriculum and have any improvement in instruction. But those kids are moving into a new grade every year, and so things may not always, you know, project along the exact same trajectory. We may see leaps in, in improvement or places where we fall off that that um, that target a little. And we'll certainly pay attention to that. But there's there's sort of cohort level goals and then kind of grade level goals. Any questions on that? No, nope, we're going good. All right, the next one is just the same um, the same indicator, but looking at the math performance. So again, this is where the, this graph shows where we were in the spring. That's the dark black line where the state as a whole was in the spring. That's the, the gray line. And then the green line is the sort of that goal line. That's where the proficiency is as established by the, the state sum of them. So there's certainly a, a bigger space between uh, where actual performance is both in RSU and across the state and where that, um, that goal is um, as established by sort of the, the assessment as it was written. Um, and so there's there's work to be done both here, but also across the state. Yes, Don. Yeah, is there any danger of the state coming down on schools that fail to perform up to the set standards? You know, I think that's a good question. I, that certainly has been something that's been talked about. I don't know specifically in Vermont, but certainly you know across the country in, in past years. I think although we continue to use this um, as a measure, you know, as a measurement of, of progress, um, even the state was, uh, you know, a little bit slower, I think, in getting this information out. Um, I think there's real recognition that things have been incredibly disrupted over the last 21 months. And so I, um, I don't anticipate that there would be, there would be a kind of punitive um, a relationship associated with the, the performance, especially given that it looks like it's pretty universal across, across the state um, to, put every, to put every school and, and, and district on a, um, some level of performance plan. I think it would be hard for them to even manage. Um, so I haven't heard, I don't know if you've heard differently on, on superintendent calls. No, I mean, I think the goal would be to say this is baseline data and they're going to be looking for now that we're past COVID, although 
it's sort of laughable, right? Because yeah. I would say that we're in the thick of it in some ways, that they're looking for growth here on out. Yeah, they have discouraged any sort of comparison of these results with past years, so you won't see that in any of ours because they don't think they're just, they're even comparable. Well, one of the reasons I ask is some of the some of the history of, of uh, state action has has got me a little sensitive about um, goals not being met, and then they come down and they put other things in place to try to remedi remediate uh, the proposed deficits of the school. So, okay, just that's helpful to hear. Yeah, no doubt. I love that. That Green Mountain Star 64 indicators as a principal, it was, yeah. it was, it was intense. <laughs> I haven't heard of that. I mean, I think what they're trying to do is say, as part of our actual recovery efforts, what, what supports do you need? How can we support you? What PD do you need? Uh, it's the first time I've had the agency call and actually say, we're offering math PD. And would you like to participate um, as like, like being proactive in the sense of offering something like that, Don, instead of coming down and saying you have to, or you're doing X. Um, so I will say that thus far, it's been pretty collaborative mm -hmm. in that regard. But you're right. In the past, it would have been we're recommending you do X, or maybe not even recommending you are doing X. Yeah, Megan? Thanks. Um, thank you for this. I've been sitting here with a question that I think I'm going to ask now because it seems like it kind of goes with this this thread that we're on, which is that I'm seeing this information and it's admirable and it looks um, like great goals. But then I'm also kind of hearing earlier in the meeting um, just thoughts about like teachers being exhausted and staff being maxed and kids needing this social emotional attention. And I'm just wondering, and I know like the data looks one way, but I'm, I want, I wonder if you could shed a little light on what it looks like and what it feels like in the, on the ground through your eyes. And does this feel achievable and like the right priority at this time? Yeah, no, I think those are, those are really good questions. I think, um, I think there's a couple ways of looking at it. One, I think we, we are doing these goals sort of at the, at the, SU level for the reason that like I don't think this is about sort of individual teachers and thinking about what's happening um, or looking at that closely at what's happening each at each in each classroom or each school at this level to figure out like where are the gap like that's that's work for us to do to in support. Um, I think I don't feel like the I think the literacy goals feel like they really are right in um, right in our in our like in our reach. There's been so much hard work done around literacy in the last number of years that um, you know we are tracking fairly closely to that proficiency mark, and I think just you know keeping our eye on that make you know makes sense. Uh, the math one feels a little bit more of a stretch, and I think we're right at the beginning of a you know a increased focus there. Um, the I think our primary goal, like this is, these are not, I don't think, I don't hide anything from teachers, but this is not what I want, would walk into a classroom with and say, this is, this is where I, you know, this is where I need, you know, we need to be, and this is the work you need to do. It, you know, when we're heading into classrooms, it's, you know, looking at what's happening in instruction, how can we help it, where, you know, where do you need more, more support? And so I'm hoping teachers, you know, continue to feel supported in it and not that we are holding them to a number um, that they've got to achieve, you know, on their own. Um, but I think, um, and I, so that's one piece, and I, I continue to want to get feedback on it. If 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 we are, if I am hearing or anyone else is hearing that it, it feels different than that in terms of what we're doing on a day to day basis, then we do see, we need to sort of change, you know, even how we're approaching teachers. Um, I, I also sort of labeled these as the academic um, indicators because I do think it's really important for us to think about all the other pieces when we're looking and thinking about where, what are the supports. So what is it looking like in terms of you know attendance and engagement? Like our kids, when they, I shared earlier that I feel like I'm hearing that kids really want to be back in our schools, you know, that may not be across the board. So how do we continue to think about, um, you know, what that looks like? Because teachers are, teachers are um, I think that's as much work on teachers to make sure that, you know, students are coming in and they're engaged. And I think that's a lot of where um, that, that can get exhausting to sort of um, to even, you know, setting up remote learning packets. You know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work to do. And so I think we're continuing to think about what are the supports that we can, we can offer to help do that. 
um, and not make sure that it, this feels like it's overshadowing any of that sort of, um, you know, in daily connection with kids. And so I appreciate, I appreciate the question to make sure that it's not, this is, we don't tip the weight so this is the only thing that we're focused on. Thank you. Yes, Ethan. Um, this is probably more of a comment than a, than a question in some ways, but I, just, you know, over the last year, as we've talked, you know, NTSS has come in and these wonderful graphs, and I'm really impressed. I mean, this is this is what Bill was asking for, is just incredibly specific data. I, I, I just always come back to, what are we doing for the art of teaching? There's a lot of science here, and I, and I really appreciate the science, and I really appreciate, you know, the specifics, but I, um, and as I said, you know, I'll take my answer offline in a way. I just... I, 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 there is an art to teaching that goes beyond numbers and science. And I hope that in the workshops where we're not seeing it or stuff that that, that work is happening. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's a great, a great question. I think again, while this is, you know, this is sort of the primary way that you all, I have engaged with you all. Like, I feel like this is, again, this is not at all sort of the conversations that are happening with teachers in terms of, you know, specific scores. Um, it's much more about, you know, as we've been saying, the, you know, engagement with students, how are we ensuring that they all feel, have a sense of belonging in our classroom? I was uh, working with teachers who were working on their parent conferences and they're setting goals for kids that are around, you know, I want to hear more of this, this, the student has great ideas, but we don't get to hear them in the classroom. How do we, how do we ensure that they feel like they can share their ideas? How do we get all, you know other students to listen to it? So it's, there's a lot of conversation around what I are you know maybe deem the more soft skills of both you know learning and, and and being a learner. And so I think we are like I think I think the focus is is on that in our classrooms. Um, and gosh, those are really hard things to measure and, and share with you all. So I think we've talked a little bit about like what's the other way that we get information. Um, you know, outside of our classrooms about what, you know, what student success looks like, what student progress looks like, because there are a lot of different pieces, I think, that we think about, and you guys know individual students, like, there's just all sorts of things that are, you know, are in play to what makes, you know, a successful day, week, or year in the school, and um, some of those uh, feel harder to communicate uh, and share in ways that um, would make sense to a broader audience um and you know sort of respect privacy and all of those pieces so we'll continue to talk about that on our end and think about yeah. any of you have ideas of the kind of information that would be helpful to you we would welcome them i i, I mean I, I gotta say it'd be really nice to hear from a couple teachers um, at the su level just bring some people in and have them talk to us and say what are they excited about that they're teaching what are they excited they're seeing and i think you give us a broad range one from different schools i'd love to see that because you know I, I, and this is just, I, I won't speak for anybody else, but I love these graphs and they're great, but they're also, I feel like I'm always looking at the same thing. And I think it needs to be backed up with some human, human, you know. Well, Ethan, uh, we're gonna have celebrations of learning at every local district monthly starting in January. And, and so I think that, that that part of the intent with that too, right? Like where you had a teacher come in actually last month Oh, yeah. is for teachers to, to be able to share and showcase what's happening in their schools. I know. I just, this an SU meeting. I, I can't help but notice, you know, a lot of people's video screens are off. I just want to, I want to, I want to get them excited. So they actually want to be, you know, part of the conversation here. Um, and, and I'm not. So we, can, we can think about how to do that at the SU level as well. Yeah. That's what I'm saying is uh, that's just an idea I'm throwing out. How do we, how do we keep yep. us engaged so that uh, it's, it's not all, technical jargon coming at us there's a little bit of um of, and i get the spirit but i just always want to encourage you to keep pushing for ways to communicate the spirit to us i i would say though there is an intentionality around doing this data with the with the board oh i understand that to I just totally say to the it. board though i don't think we were an analytical organization what i mean by that is i don't think we were using data to inform instruction yeah. And part of what on a regular basis, right? And not about it being punitive, about saying, how can I use data to say, how might I use it to in, it, mm -hmm. inform what I do in the classroom? And so what you're saying, Ethan, is how we, why I'm so excited about the work we're doing with Upper Valley Educators Institute is it's about using protocols 
at each of our building levels and teachers are leading these discussions to say, what is the data telling us and how can we use that to better practice? It. I mean, and what resources do we need? So maybe that's a next step too, to yeah. even to have a few of those data leaders talk to the board about how they are utilizing uh, data to look at instruction that way. Because it's it's the other side of that. It's the other side of this graph. I mean, we're getting we're getting your side of the graph, and to hear from a teacher or a lead a lead person in that thing, what they're taking from the graph and how they're transferring it. That would be amazing. That would really get me excited to hear. We can do that. Thank you. Um, I'll just go quickly through the, the next couple and see if there's um, any other questions around that. So on the math indicator, we've got the same the same graph. The uh, you know the goals for each um, of each interim year are you know a little bit larger um, given where our starting spot is in in math, um, and we're aiming again for that proficiency benchmark. And that's an average. Um, and we talked about a little bit before why we use the average. I think it. It gives us a good sense of you know where the the whole the whole SU is um, and doesn't get as thrown off by sort of the small the small school sizes or just getting over that um, you know kid, uh, every every score counts. It's not either you're in in the proficiency range or or off. If you're fairly close, then your average still contributes to that. So the next slide is just again the graphic representation. You can see those dots are a little bit more spread out. We've got a little further to to go on the on the math side. Um, so we will be working on that. Uh, and certainly that gets a little bit wider as we get upper, uh, higher up in the grades. The second indicator that we talked about last time is around, um, I, I talked about the importance of looking at the average, but we also want to focus on these, uh, on students that are, you know, um, sort of in the furthest from meeting the proficiency mark. And they're kind of in that, in red in this graph, uh, sort of the way we receive the information from the state. Um, and this is just looking again across the whole the whole SU um, and the percentage of students that are in each of those levels. Um, again, we think about spring 2021 as being the baseline. So this is where we're kind of starting the goal setting from. Uh, this graph is for the for the reading levels. Um, and then we're just looking to basically have each of those um, those percentages in red um, for each grade level. So that's what you'll see on the next slide uh, with the the. the the goal, the difference between the goal and the per current performance, and then those interim targets um, where we're trying to, and those numbers are going to go down each year because we're trying to reduce the number of students who are furthest from um, kind of meeting the, the grade level proficiency. So that's the, the uh, English language arts. The next two slides are around math. Again, the taking that level one performance who are not yet meeting proficiency um, and then and, um, having it to by the by 2025 um, and getting those down to you know between sort of 10 percent and uh and 25 percent depending on the grade level and then our our third indicator around academic achievement um is again we you know it, we think really important work happens in our youngest grades they are not um they are not tested on the state summative so that's not you know that's not the right measurement um, we have another number of assessment tools that we use both at the individual school level and the district level and then across the su um, and we're at the point now where we've got um kind of different tools some of them are the similar same and some of them are different um, and we're sort of doing a deep dive to figure out what's gonna give us the best information. Um, and for us, you know, especially at that grade level, it's most important that the information is helpful to teachers to, you know, to inform their practice, helpful to parents so they know exactly, and parents and guardians so they know where their students are, and potentially even helpful to students so they can set their own goals. And so that's, those are the things that we are looking at when we're looking at all these tools. Um, so we're not in a position right now to choose a tool and pick a goal based on that. Um, but know that like that's that's sort of the work that will happen this year. We'll do some piloting of um, different um, tools and look at it sort of SU wide, um, and then be able to um, to implement something next year and set a baseline based on that. So we are that one's a little bit further away, but the work is kind of ongoing, looking at that information um, to determine what makes sense for setting a SU wide goal. And that's that's all I've got. Thank you so much for all of this. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to um, thank Jamie and Elinda um, for their work. Uh, we were back in October, uh, Anna gave us uh, a detailed report about academic performance. 
graphs and charts, um, great detail. Um, I've been in organizations when I when we talked about defining where we want to go and then make it meaningful, measurable, and attainable. Um, there's resistance. There's uh, apprehension. There's a feeling that my gosh, uh, who's to say I'm I'm going to sign in the dotted line that we can get here or there. That's not the case with our supervisory staff and leadership. I take this to mean that they welcome this as meaningful, attainable, measurable things that we can do, we can achieve, but we can meet or exceed the state's goals set by the uh, Department of Education. Um, and I think the building block of having sustain sustainable goals that are actually met is the commitment of our administrative team. And Jamie, I just asked you this question. Do you believe what Anna has put down here as goals and indicators um, for this fiscal year, next fiscal year to fiscal year 25 are meaningful, measurable, and attainable by this SU? Absolutely, yeah. What we, I think is important, and I also think it's necessary, is for the board to commit ourselves to the achievement of these goals. We are part of the team, and if our leadership, our support, um, our diligence will help our staff, our teachers, um, and every district achieve these very important goals. These are not the only goals. And Ethan is absolutely right. There's so many things going on that we need to be careful, caring about. But these are fundamental. Uh, I think these are the kind of the core of our moral requirement as school directors. And so I think it's important for this SU board to adopt these goals uh, and indicators. And I'd like to make a motion if it's okay with the chair uh, for consideration and vote by the SU this evening. And my motion is it all right to move? Yep. And I'd like to move that the White River Valley Supervisory Union adopt the academic achievement goals and indicator targets for FY22 through FY25 as enumerated in the White River Valley Supervisory Union academic progress report dated today, November 22nd, uh, 2021. I second that. Second that. <clears throat> Any discussion on the motion? I, I would just like to say that I totally support it. I think it's in line with everything we're working on in the SU and setting goals and achievements and um, it, it seems to feel like a great thing for the board to put their support behind. All right, so. Oh, sorry, can I just add one comment? Um, yeah. I, I, I also think that this is wonderful and thank you, Anda, for um, kind of hearing the call and moving it forward and moving it forward, I think beyond you know, what we had envisioned, which is great. Um, I would just add that I would like to see um, just kind of regular check-ins on this and you know know early if we're in danger of not um you know if there are any challenges or if there's any um yeah, if there's anything getting in the way um you know as bill said the you know the board is here to help in any way we can many of us are not educators but if there's any way we can help um help you troubleshoot or get around potential blockers uh please let us know thank you i appreciate all right so I will call the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And nays? All right, hearing none, it passes. All right, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. <coughs> Jamie, is that you next? Yeah, so um, this is just discussion. And so I, I mentioned it uh, last month about preliminary discussions about how could we further try to partner with our neighbors to the north. Um, so I've had 
a meeting with the Net Roads, um, Andrea Wasson, who is their student support services um, person at Central Vermont Supervisory Union, uh, Chris Locarno, the director of finance and operations for CVSU, Tara Weatherall, um, our, our director of finance, and, um, and I met um, at our SU office and started to talk about how could we uh, build support for our students and do it in a more efficient way um, and not have to look to add a bunch of resources to either SU. And so with that framework, what we realized is, is that our alternative programming for social emotional supports is going quite well um, across our grade levels that we serve. Uh, and remember, we added the high school programming to that uh, last year. They were in need of some support at the middle school level for social emotional supports. And we've identified we are in need of some supports at the middle high school level around, I'm looking at Annette just to make certain I'm not misspeaking. She keeps me in line if I'm not. They, that team, does, this team does a good job of that. Um, of how to support students who have more global cognitive delays um, and or who are on the autism spectrum. Um, our programming's not built to support students who would be served via those disability categories. And so the concept that we wanted to share with you to see if there's support behind this is the concept that they would take on um, a max of five of our students who would fit those that profile. No, that would be tuition free. And that we would take on a max of five of their students who fit that profile around needing social emotional supports, mm -hmm. tuitions free. Yeah. The location that we talked about doing our alternative programming, right now it's housed in Bethel. This concept would be to utilize, we're going to have some space available in Chelsea. I've talked to the first branch board about this. And they, at that point, you know, again, it was discussion. I didn't hear a big opposition about the idea of us moving our programming here to Chelsea because the Chelsea wing next year at the elementary school will be vacated uh, based on restructuring efforts between Chelsea and Tunbridge. So we have a space there. And CVSU also indicated that they would be willing to support us financially with some heating and electric because it will save them some money on transportation because they're, they, they neighbor us right in Chelsea. And so they would be willing to support some heating and electrical cost at the Chelsea campus for first branch um, if the programming was housed there. So we saw that as an added benefit. Um, as far as staffing for us, the budget that you have right now does um, provide the staffing levels needed to support that middle school programming. Um, and what we would look to do is reassign one more additional para to the middle school staff. Um, and keep the staffing where we currently have it. Mm -hmm. And um, again, this would be uh, just for the middle school programming for us, uh, but they would service some students for us middle through high school. Don. Yeah, I just as a observation, I hope that we would, uh, before we go putting a lot of money into the building, um, has the school board solved their ownership issue between the town At and first the branch? Yes. Yeah. So first branch owns the building. There are some parcels of land under the building that they don't own. My understanding is I'm looking at Tara Cathy though, is that there's that, that parcel is actually not under the elementary, believe it or not. It's actually under the library, which is in the middle of the building. Um, and we are not actually looking to put any money in it. I think what, what we are actually looking to do is just offset the heating and electrical costs. I don't see us needing to actually spend any money um, doing any improvements to the building. The space is yeah. there. Right. All right. If good. you guys are in support, the next step would be um, what I would, I, what I would um, recommend we do is we would, we would look to work out an MOU uh, and Dina would create that, our school attorney, um, in collaboration with their attorney, Bernie Lambeck. That's how we did the past MOU. And then I would share that MOU with you uh, prior um, to taking action. And it really wouldn't need even action until <coughs> January. Uh, 
again, we're not looking to add money to our budget. So your decision actually doesn't even, it doesn't impact our budgeting. Other than I would just say, I do get really excited about the idea of having better supports for upwards of five of our students where we do have a gap. And so we, if we weren't doing this, we would be looking to have to try to either build our own programming for those five students or possibly look at out of district placements. And I shared with a board recently, um, just so folks know, out of district placement costs have gone up significantly in tuition. Um, and I'll give you an example that's real. East Valley Academy, which is connected with Clara Martin in East Randolph, their tuition went into from the low 30s, and I'm probably being genuine, generous with this. I actually think it was in the high 20s, but low 30s, and in two years, it's gone up to over $100,000 per student um, in tuition. And so the more that we can partner regionally with our SUs to try to play on each other's strengths, I definitely think it behooves us. Um, and so these are conversations that I continue to try to just put out there to my superintendent colleagues around working more regionally to better support our students in a more sustainable way. Um, because I will say right now, the tuition cost of um, specialized programming seems to be increasing, you know, tenfold uh, annually. And it's really just not gonna be sustainable for us. Which I know those are conversations you were having when you built your alternative programming to begin with, right? And so it's just saying what other specialized programming do we wanna to look to expand and not always having to build it in house? Are there regional partners that we can partner with? Jamie, along those lines, um, in the past, there was what was known as the Green Mountain Forest, uh, Green Mountain Collaborative, and that was an association of uh, school districts around the area that had those conversations ongoing. And I believe that uh, there were a lot of people that were involved in it, and that's kind of gone out, passed away since all this consolidation has been going on. That may be something that you might be interested in revisiting. Yeah, it's a great idea, Don. And it's all, now that you say that, I think we're all new blood too, um, from who were the superintendents in that original group. And I, I think you're right, it would behoove us to revisit that. Do you need a motion for us? No, I don't need anything right now. I just want to make certain that as like, unless, I wanted to see if the board was strongly opposed to us continue to pursue this. If folks are feeling good about this type of concept, That's then I'll continue to do my homework on it and work toward um, coming back to you with a draft MOU for discussion in December. And then I would even look for you to take action until like January. Oh. Does anybody have any strong objections? If not, we're gonna let the SU continue on their path. Oh. Okay. All right, perfect. Awesome, thanks. Thank you. And I'll come to the board with an update on that Green Mountain um, concept as well. Don, for next month, I'll reach out to those colleagues that were part of that and see what how they feel about getting that up and going again. Yes, central office first. And Tara is up. We're going to start with the central office expenditure budget first. So overall, again, we're just looking at the expenditures. Overall, the suggested budget is up 7.7%, which is equivalent to $139,091. And the areas that are impacted the most are under curriculum. We're looking to add a support role there. So we've added in benefits or salary for that. There is a Can I just jump in real quick, Sarah? Sorry, just to <laughs> clarify that a little more. I think the question was come up. So we talked about this last month, and I will tell you that in general, this is the biggest change to your budget, and that's why I wanted to jump in. And so, 
the, really the biggest increase is, is this idea of having a curriculum coordinator position under ONDA to help facilitate curriculum alignment. I would say in general, um, that is an area of weakness for us right now, is having clearly articulated um, st standards around what we expect students to know, understand, and do at each grade level cluster. And so it's become pretty apparently clear that that's gonna re result in needing additional support. Um, the White River Unified District, which is a, a, you know, a 44% stakeholder in your SU, currently has a position that is doing that work locally for their district. The issue is I have real concerns and I've talked, Andrew's here, I've talked to their board about this, is uh, we have the largest district doing this work and I worry about stakeholder buy-in, right? Like curriculum is SU for statute. And so I really think we need to make certain we have teachers across the SU doing this work together. I also think it's important we don't have districts getting out ahead. And then when we, because that could create frustration for RUT, right? Like if all of a sudden they're doing some curriculum development work and they go down in a direction and then as the SU, we've decided that that's not the direction that makes the most sense. Right, because we have a lot more districts than we have six of us than just Rudd. I really worry um, about the fallout that could happen there. And so the idea would be is to take the resource that's happening in Rudd. Rudd would no longer have that resource locally in their district, but we would add this cost at the SU level. Rudd would continue to get the service that they're currently getting right now locally, but that we would spread that wealth across the SU. And so to be transparent, there would certainly be savings for RUD. That money though would move over to the SU budget. RUD still does cover 44% of the SU budget, but I think it would benefit all of our districts. And so that's the proposal. And I would say that that's the thing I need you guys to give us the most feedback on in this budget. That's why I wanted to jump in and just talk about that for a little bit. Because that is the big, that is really the, the biggest change. Jamie, just um, if I may, Kathy, if that's okay. Um, uh, here's my first thought. I just, I sort of remembered in my memory, I mean, your logic makes total sense, but I sort of felt like we got rid of our curriculum coordinator at this SU level to bring on a Anda. Anda. And um, I just, I don't know. I'm a little confused then that now we're coming back and adding a position that we had well, and rid of. And so I. Um, so prior to ONDA, we had a curriculum coordinator and we had three other administrators under with, that were kind of in combination with the curriculum coordinator. So we had a curriculum coordinator, a grants coordinator. We had the. Two instructional coaches. One was Charlie Watson, one was Amy Ta. One was focused uh, a little bit more on proficiency type work and pathways, and one was focused on literacy. And so we went from four down to one mm -hmm. admin. And I would say if we had curriculum developed, I think that that would be fine. What I would say is what I didn't know last October is how lacking we were in curriculum development in general. Um, and so that is the, that's the change. The way is, is that. Is there a way to show us how much we were spending for those four people, how much we yep. say Neon Onda, and then how much we're putting back? I think that would help me. Absolutely. Because um, th then I would sort of feel like we're still saving money as opposed to boom, we're just adding another hundred thousand in i think it's that makes complete sense okay Ethan, if you look at the budget that was provided to you in your packet you will see the 20 budgets in there which provided that information so in the grant admin it was sixty three thousand dollars and in the district wide, which is where those two instructional coaches were, was $152,000. So that's, I didn't catch the numbers fast enough, but we're talking. So we're still dealing with a savings of 
What, about, what is that, Terry? You're much faster with this than me. 100,000, something like that? Well, for that new position, we're budgeting 75, and essentially that would replace the two um, instructional coaches plus the, you know, the grant coordinator Onda has taken on. So what's the difference there? Yeah. If you can. No, Tara's pulling that together, but I also think we can articulate it next draft. We're not looking for action on this tonight. Uh, just, it, 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 it's a good way to sell it as opposed to when it's out in the blue by itself, it feels like suddenly we're adding things back in and I just, we need to No, I hear you completely. I, I would say it's actually something that I've been concerned about, Ethan. Stacy, you had a question while they're working on that number? Sure, thanks, Kathy. Um, I just wanted to make sure, so it sounds like this is a position that exists in RUD and is gonna be moved over to the SU. Is RUD still going to be able to manage, are they going to suffer from not having full-time access to that? Are they going to be able to cover um, any shortage or are they gonna need additional support to replace that? Their board chair's on it. They haven't pushed back against the concept yet and they've seen a few drafts of it, so. Okay. 141,000, Ethan. Savings? Yeah. Maggie, yes. Savings from when we had roughly four or five people to Onda and then back to this Onda plus curriculum coordinator. Is that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, raise the point. I, I trust your leadership and I trust the wisdom of the group, but I wanted to voice a thought that I, I'm, I'm not sure about this and I'm wondering about building leaders or, or building administrators as instructional leaders, helping to sort of do this alignment. I think, we, I think that Jamie and Anda are doing a great job as is. And I'm wondering if we might want to give it another year to sort of move with that and see if we can. Um, I know that our building leaders are are maxed, but sort of use go with that angle so that I guess I'm generally less um, in need of the, of the real alignment that you're wanting in the in the central office. Um, anyway, I think you're doing a good job as is, and I'm wondering if we want to give it a year. But I'll trust the group as we move forward with it. My, as a board member, my thought would be no. I think we move forward to align our schools with curriculum is something we've been doing, thought we were trying to do for a while now. Sarah? Yeah, I I have a real concern. Um, I mean, I this makes sense to me. I can't say that it doesn't, but um, as we develop our local budgets, it's going to be, it's really important for me um, as a member of the Stratford board to stay under the, the threshold and um, having this increase then is going to affect that and our ability and what we're going to have to take cuts and hits on and um, that concerns me and, um, you know, that concerns me. <laughs> Um, so I just want to want to voice some concern around this. You yeah, know, I think it concerns us too, Sarah, and I appreciate that. That's why I think we have to talk these things through. I think what I what's been concerning for me as a superintendent is a big charge of mine in statute is to ensure you guys have an aligned curriculum. And if right now I'm not delivering on that, and so I at least wanted to have this conversation even if it's through budget, to just point out to you that we do not have a strong curriculum document right now. Literacy is the best, mm -hmm. but in the other content areas right now, it is significantly lacking. Mm -hmm. I actually had a Rochester Stockbridge resident request it in paper form, who I'm actually meeting with tomorrow, who was pretty disgusted by it. Mm -hmm. um, those were his words, and I don't think he'd mind me sharing it. Um, and I got to say, I don't, I don't have a good way to defend it. 
because it is pretty unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And so what, what I am saying is, is that I, I believe that we need support in order to carry that out. And I don't believe my teachers in, in a principals right now have the bandwidth to want to do it. And I think that that's the trying part we have right now is that we're supposed to have it, but yet I don't know if they have the bandwidth bandwidth to want to sit down and to, to start to dive into it. Um, at that level it would take without that coordinator position. And so that's, I think that that's the um, trying part we have right now. The other thing that, you know, that we've done in the past, like around our COVID coordinator and things is we've provided leadership stipends to, in order to get some of this work done. And we've been somewhat successful with that. Um, so, I mean, that is a, another angle that we could potentially try to pursue. It's just really, I think, again, you've heard me talk about the budget being a policy statement. And so this is as much an opportunity for me to say, we are in worse shape in this than I guess I realized it on does help me realize it, um, by really digging into it. And just saying that we just need to understand realistic goals around it, and it's definitely a priority, but it may take us longer if we don't have the horsepower to just get there. That's all. And and I would say that in general, I I don't you could ask your principals this. I think everything that I've been asking them to do is pretty much got them at their max at the moment. And in certain districts, we've actually decreased the FTE in our principals. And we're proposing to do that in first branch as well this upcoming year um, is to go from two to one. And so the principal bandwidth has decreased just a little bit as well. I understand that. And and I mean, I'm the thing that a, a couple of years ago, prior to you, we had passed the, um, the SU budget and then uh, Stratford had a real hard time um, getting our budget together and, and staying below the threshold. And the only cuts that we could then make were on our budget because the SU budget was cut off, was, was passed already. And I just want to have that out there now. Um, you know, because I mean, I feel like sometimes we're between a rock and a hard place. Um, the other thing I would say too, Sarah, is for me, I'm thinking about, ask, you know, I think we thought for the SU budget, but we're also going to see our budget. So maybe we won't feel as uncomfortable depending on what our budgets look like. We won't feel like we're in so much crunch time. Um, um, I'm hopeful that that might be the situation. Um, but we just passed a um, pretty healthy um, set of goals. And I, I don't want to, I, I want to make, I want to put the tools in the toolbox to be able to make those goals happen. So I agree. I guess I'm torn. I hear what you're saying. What? Um, Ethan, you your hand up. Yeah. What about what about halftime? I mean, are we planning to hire the person who's already there? Um, no, so, not necessarily. No. Okay. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I, this is a but the, everything's a trade off. I know we have those goals, but it's also a trade off to be financially responsible. Can we afford a full time position? Can we afford a part-time position? I don't know. These are, I think, I, I, I think I need to see some options. That would be good. So, yeah, well, I mean, I'd be happy to come back in December. You're going to have your revenue portion of your budget too in December, right? And so in December, we can come to you actually with three options on the expenditure side. We could come to you full-time, part-time, no. And then you can get a sense. It, we also remember break it down for you in regards to what does that mean impacting you guys at each district level. And so we could give you those three options to just weigh and discuss. That, I, I think. Let's do that. Yes, I think that's a good idea. Me too. Meg, I didn't see what you said, but was right. it about curriculum being in statute? 
Yeah, I just put the statute that you refer to in there. It's right up in the beginning, what you're saying. Thank you. Sometimes I, I like to look back at those. I like the idea of the um, stipends for teacher leaders. I think that's an interesting concept. I could see that like working really well distributively and like spreading the manpower. Because I'll, I'll say another one of my concerns is just we're such an enormous SU that like thinking about a person covering all that space and going to all those schools is like huge. So and I also just love to empower teachers in that way. So. I'll, I'll look forward to hearing back what you guys come up with. Yeah, so maybe that's a, a fourth option in what you present us is no uh, part, you know, uh, teacher stipends or en enhancement stipends, whatever you call them, part time and then full time. You guys are making that's terrible overtime. Don, thank you. That, that topic might be something worth negotiating in the upcoming process. Yeah, I'm hearing you, Don. Yep. All right, guys. All right, so you want to continue? That's the biggest part of the of the this SU level, which is I said to the team today, we really need to have that conversation. So um, I would just like to speak in support of this, just in that, you know, apparently. Um, our district has been doing this already, so that means that things were deficient and we needed to supplement it on our own budget. So, you know, I, I do think this work needs to be done and it makes sense to have it done at the SU level if it's supposed to be aligned across all the uh, districts. And the other part of it is we did just review all those goals and, you know, they can't just be random numbers that we're putting out there that we're not like actively working to meet. and. One of the main ways that we would improve our scores and math and all that is figuring out where we're not improving our curriculum to get it better. So having, you know, a dedicated position to doing that is makes sense to me as one of the things that we're doing to really actively reach those goals. Yeah. Thanks for that context, Andrew. That's really helpful. I wonder if you or anyone in the S central office can speak to kind of where you identified the need for that within your district and like what, like, have you seen any quantifiable outcomes? Have you seen any increase in your own, anything like measurable or just like teachers are happier, the burden is off of them? Um, I'd have to let the administration speak to that. Okay, fine. Jamie, back I mean, to you. No, I mean, Stacy. I would say that it was the White River Unified District principals who recognized that, right? Like, it was a, a failure in regards to having clear, identifiable, identifiable goals in each content area and saying, <clears throat> we got to move. And so they came up with this idea of an academic coordinator to help do that work around alignment. Um, and so they would speak to, I think that has served them quite well. And I would agree with them that has served them quite well. I just see that there's an equity issue that we don't have that same level of service to the rest of your districts. And so that's my concern. Um, and you know, it just, it's, it seemed to make some sense based on the fact that that was happening in our largest district. And again, just to point out, you, you're not seeing this in front of you tonight, but your largest district does pay 44% of the bills at the SU office. Um, so when we break out the assessment, I think for the added benefit, once we show you the revenue side of it, we may recognize it's not actually increasing your assessment all that much. Don? I just suggest we move on and come back with those options for the next topic, the next meeting. Um, all right, everybody's good on this topic. We're gonna come back next time. Okay. Um, Tara, you get to continue on that. Okay. We're gonna let Tara continue now. So this year we had to add the next section, which is your English language learner. We actually had um, a need for that. So that is an SUI position. That is a shared position. So that is now in your budget at the SU. And then the next section is our technology. 
Increase there is on contracted services. I'm just going to switch screens, going back between multiple items. And that is for um, contractors that we use throughout the supervisory union to support our technology department. And that's based on projections on what we'll need in the next fiscal year. No any substantial changes in the superintendent's office. The next section is the preschool coordinator position. You'll see that we had a substantial decrease there, and that was in the way that we reformatted that position. So rather than having a preschool interventionist full-time and also having the preschool coordinator position, our preschool interventionist is now doing the preschool coordination on a stipend. So you'll see that change there. In fiscal services, the areas where my increases were um, were offset also by the position that I cut. So my increase is in the contracted services, and that's for paychecks. And I reduced the payroll position to offset that expense. And then in central office, not any substantial increase there. The small adjustments I had to make were the increase on our rent based on our lease agreement, our property insurance, and our telephone expenses. We've seen some increase there. So I've updated um, the, the estimated expenses for that. And then the instructional salary, that's our pre-K interventionist. And then grant admin's been cut. And then district-wide, that's where those positions were previously. And we just leave um, contracted services and some supplies, books, and periodicals, and dues and fees that are used throughout um, professional development for district-wide services. So that is the overall adjustments in the central office. Any additional questions before we move on to special education? Ray, if you could put the special education budget up, please. So top section, this is our triple E. So this is early learners. This is our preschoolers. No substantial adjustments there. We don't have anything in the idea of the pre-K teachers other than some, actually no, we cut that out, so that's old. Nothing in idea B to K basic, nothing in triple E, SLPs, that's speech language, no OTs, other than some contracted services that we get for some of our early preschoolers. So down in the special education teacher salaries, that represents 16 FTE and also the intensive program coordinator that we put in place this year that's grant funded. And then the support staff salaries, that is our paras, and we have 38.8 FTEs there. And then the next substantial increase in the special education is down on special education tuition. You'll see that's an increase of $711,468. And that is purely based on the increase in tuition that Jamie was speaking to earlier. We have reduced the idea B tuition because that has come out of the grant. So you'll see that reduction there. And there is also a reduction in the psychological services. Um, that's our Paramar and classroom case managers. Where are you? Um, I am under where it says total 2140 psychological services. Yeah, thanks. Are you with me? I can't see your screen on the big screen, right? So I don't know I understand. where you are. Yeah, 2140. Okay. Sorry, I was going too fast. So the next section is special education SLPs. Again, that's speech language. We have 3.8 FTEs and 1.0 SLP aid. Nothing in idea B, speech disability. The next section is our occupational therapist. 
we have 2.0 FTEs there and then 2.0 of their CODAs, which are their assistants. So no substantial changes there. We reduced the special education other support services because that's no longer necessary. We've increased the instructional staff trainings based on what Annette had shared in her report and our plan moving forward with our ongoing professional development series. And then the next section is the special education administration. We still have 1.0 in the admin and 2.8 in her support team. No substantial changes. We have increased the contracted transportation, so we're at 2,700, right? Transportation almost to the end. Yeah. And that is um, what we pay Butler to transport our students, but also what we reimburse parents who transport their students to their schools. And then the IDV transportation, you have a reduction there of 80,000. So overall, the special education budget is up $154,321 or 1.92%, so less than 2%. And as we indicated, you'll see the revenue side, which offsets the expenses on both the central office and on the special education side next month. Don? Tara, um, on each section, you've, you've highlighted the FTEs. Is there any place that you could put those in there so that you wouldn't have to remind us what, they, uh, what they're attributed to? Yes, I can give you my notes section next time. Thank you. But it was in the, um, the budget segments that I presented previously. It was also in the notes there. Yeah, I wonder if it would be helpful to have kind of a summary that would maybe have those notes, but also, you know, it seems like there's the stuff we kind of control, which is our local providing of instruction, and then there's the stuff we tuition out. And obviously the tuition out has gone up significantly and we've cut the local spending. So it'd be kind of interesting to see that more directly um, if there was some sort of summary we could do about that. <coughs> Good. Any more questions about the budget draft tonight? All right. Thank you, Tara. You're welcome. Thanks, guys. All right. Um, career change assistance program. I think we've all seen this at our local boards at this point. Just to uh, remind folks, this is Article 17 of the MA, um, and what it would allow is for those who have uh, provided service to us greater than 15 years, um, if you were to approve it, would then be allowed to apply uh, for career change assistance, which would result in uh, a payment of 80% of their salary and uh, life insurance benefit. Um, that would be a significant potentially a significant increase in this budget to budget for that. Um, you're not seeing it budgeted for, and um, all of our, our member districts have uh, voted to not support that, just so the SU board knows. That's Motion. Second. Second. Any I'll make a motion to, sorry, go ahead, Don. Yeah, I would like to make a motion to not go along with the Article 17 verbiage. Seconded. Is there any discussion on the item? All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? And this still passes. Thanks, guys. So, Article 10, we did our, we've done both of our action items. Any resignations, new hires we need to talk about? Enough. Any other business for the board tonight? Um, next meeting date, ma Monday, December 27th. I wanted to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping to propose that the board calendar is actually open for the 20th. 
Um, no. I wanted to propose. I wanted to propose that it's a little farther away from the holiday, and uh, it also allows us some opportunity. If the SU budget isn't approved on the twentieth, we could warn a special meeting on the twenty seventh and just take action on that. Um, and again, we'll have those couple of different scenarios for you to wait on the twentieth, but. We like to have the budget for the SU put to bed by the end of December, because it does, like Sarah say, inform the budget process for your local budget. So I'd like to, for you to consider the 20th, and then we have some time if we need a special meeting on the 27th. Unless anybody strongly object, we'll move our next meeting to Monday, December 20th, and the location will be at the central office. Awesome. And it says on the agenda's executive board? No, that's full board. Yep. It'll be a full board. So December twentieth, full board at the central. The central office will be the location. Okay. Um, just like to, to sorry, just to clarify, is that twenty seventh meeting now on the books, or is that only if needed? It'll be if needed. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Needed. Great. All right, guys, need a motion to adjourn. Moved. Got a second. Night off. Good night. Good night, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Same to you. Happy Thanksgiving.